Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and today we are going to look at the synthesis where we are going to start with cyclohexanone and we are going to end up with this monstrosity on the right. So, how are we going to accomplish that? Well, first of all, when it comes to complex synthesis like that, if you see something like that on your exam or on the homework, do not panic. I can guarantee that you do know all the steps to accomplish that, the key here is to find those steps. And when I analyze my molecules, when I see what type of reactions I'm going to be using in my synthesis, the two things that I'm going to be looking at is first, am I going to be making any new carbon-carbon bonds? And in this case we are making new carbon-carbon bonds because we are going to be adding this phenyl group over here here, so we are absolutely going to be making a new carbon-carbon bond. And if I'm going to be making new carbon-carbon bonds, it's likely going to be via the Grignard reaction, as that one is going to be one of the premier methods for the carbon-carbon bond making in our class. And the next thing that I always want to ask myself is, am I seeing any functional group patterns or anything that can hint towards what type of functional group uh, transformations I might be looking at? And in this case, I also have something very interesting. I have this OH and this oxygen of my ether looking in the opposite directions from each other. So those are trans to each other. That means that we can either possibly add those via the dihydroxylation reaction from the epoxide, or since they are not both OH groups, maybe that was some other type of epoxide opening. So that gives me a good idea that because I have my OHs being trans to each other, I am likely going to be seeing some epoxide chemistry going on here. Well, if I'm talking about the epoxide opening, probably I should show the epoxide as my predecessor to my final products, which would be a molecule looking like this. Notice I have a very specific stereochemistry here, because I know that when I'm doing the epoxide opening, I'm going to be preserving the stereochemistry of one center, and I'm going to be inverting the stereochemistry of uh, the other carbon of my epoxide with whatever nucleophile I am attacking here. And I can add this OCH3 that I have up top via the basic opening of the epoxide. So if I'm adding a basic or nucleophilic agent to my epoxide, then I'm going to be opening that epoxide from the less substituted side, which is right over here. So that means that when my nucleophile, my OCH3-1, that guy is going to be coming in and attacking the epoxide, opening it, it's going to be doing it from the opposite side, from where the oxygen of the epoxide currently is, which means that the oxygen of the epoxide is going to end up looking away from us, and OCH3 is going to be coming at us. Now, how are we going to make an epoxide? Well, via the epoxidation reaction, of course, which means that the predecessor here is going to be a corresponding alkene. Next, I want to think about how I'm going to be making my alkene, and typically we're going to be making alkenes via the elimination reaction, which means that my predecessors where X is my leaving group going to look like this or that. And since I do remember that I do want to add the phenyl group to my molecule via the Grignard reaction, uh, that means that my X that I have over here, which is most likely going to be an OH group, better be on the same atom where I am adding a new carbon-carbon bond, which means that I am going to discard my other option. And if my X is the OH, I can easily make that from my starting material via the Grignard reaction itself. So now, when we have all the intermediates in this retrosynthetic analysis, let's fill in the gaps and show the actual synthetic pathway. So I'm going to start by taking my starting material and treating it with phenyl magnesium bromide with the corresponding aqueous workup afterwards, giving me a tertiary alcohol that looks like this. Next, I'm going to perform a simple dehydration reaction using something like sulfuric acid and heat, which is going to give me my alkene. Then we are going to do the epoxidation, where MCPB is probably the most common epoxidizing agent. However, if you like to use MMPP or maybe uh, peroxyacetic acid or something like that, you are more than welcome to do so as well. So epoxidation here going to create a chiral carbon, so I'm going to start showing the stereochemistry here, and I will also indicate that I'm going to make that 
plus the corresponding enantiomer. Then we are going to open our epoxide in basic media, so I'm going to use something like, let's say, sodium methoxide in methanol as a solvent, as a base, it's going to open my epoxy from the less substituted side, which is the left side in this particular molecule, giving me a negatively charged intermediate with OCH3 looking at us, specifically because this reaction always follows the SN2 style reaction, and of course in this case, because we had a racemic mixture to begin with, we are going to have this product plus the corresponding enantiomer here as well. And the last bit that we have left here is to take our uh, intermediate here and treat that with acid to protonate our O-. So I will say that my last step here is going to be acidic workup and we have our target molecule synthesized. So as you can see, for as long as you do not panic and use the power of the retrosynthetic analysis, any kind of synthesis, even something as complicated and as intimidating looking like this, can be quite easily accomplished by using using simple steps and the reactions that you have already seen in your class. What did you guys think about this synthesis? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you like this video and learned something new today, hit that like button to help promote it and help more students see it. Thank you for watching till the very end. Subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates. Watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow.